You're listening to Mr. Liverpool himself, Frank Carlisle, exclusively, exclusively on Mersey Radio. Good evening, everybody, and that was Darling by Frankie Miller who opened the show, and it's me, Frank Carlisle, for Mersey Radio. We've got a great show tonight, anyway, great music. We've got uh, Terry Melia in. He's on about 8.15, something like that, talking about his new novel. And Terry's a local lad, so we'll be talking to him a little bit later on. Well, in about 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes or so. We've got Jamie Williams in. He's uh, he's a guest, and we'll be talking lots of things. Paranormal, football, you name it. And then we've got Michael Carter on. He's on at 9.15. He'll be talking all football because um, it's with the, the, the weekend results that's, that's uh, you know, it's paramount to football fans, both Liverpool and Evertonians, Everton. And, of course, Joe Whittaker, our Hollywood correspondent. Absolutely amazing what's been happening in America. We've got the anniversary of 9-11, which I'll be talking to Jamie about in a minute or two. Um, we've got the Hurricane Irma, and now we're going, we're going to get the remnants of Irma in the next couple of days, which is uh, horrendous, to be honest, and coming up to the weekend also. So there's lots of uh, lots of topic, shall we say, to be talked about. Anyway, the weather. What is the weather? What is the weather? And the weather... What do you think of the weather, Jamie, right now? Right now, right this minute? Not tomorrow or the next day. What do you think of the weather right now? Awful, unpredictable, cold. That's well, it. this is it, because yeah. well, if you ever go on social network, people are actually putting the heating on. So, therefore, it is bad. Yeah. It is bad. And uh, it just, just shows you, doesn't it, you know, the change in weather, because no matter what in this country... You cannot, you cannot legislate for a good day, no matter what. You can't plan anything, that is. And when people are getting married, they always say, like, the June bride, for, for example, the June yes. bride. And I've seen some June brides absolutely soaking wet, which is a shame. And that's just going in about 20 yards into either the church or a registry office because they have to walk that distance. And you know what? I always see these brides. I don't know about you. When they, you know, when it's raining, no one ever carries an umbrella. No one ever carries an umbrella. I don't know about you. Have you ever I, seen? I've got one in the piece of my car. I've never took it out yet. Well, there you go. Yeah. And I, 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 um, I, I've bought more umbrellas than the umbrella shop. To be honest, because I always leave umbrellas in taxis. Forever, even in bars, you know, when I've gone out yeah. and it's been lashing down and I've been having a beer or two, and the next I just walk out and lost. Gone. They're very flimsy as well and cumbersome, aren't they? I mean, how many times have you had an umbrella and you turn inside out? Um, well, I buy good ones. <laughs> I'm sorry about that, Jamie. I wouldn't. <laughs> you, know? you keep leaving them in pubs and bars. And <laughs> <laughs> exactly, you know? and that's why I go mad. I go, oh, wow, why did I leave that, you know? But, you know, that's me, that's me, all that. So what did you think of the game on uh, Sunday? Because you're a big Liverpool yeah, fan. Yeah, very, very... It was, was it Saturday, wasn't it? Saturday, yeah. yeah. Very, very painful. Saturday, but, yeah. you know, these things happen <clears> to the best of them. And um, I think the turning point was the sending off. No, oh, well, they were getting beat, weren't they? Yeah. I mean, I mean, we got thrashed in the end, didn't we? But well, the thing is, um, my daughter Francine said she's a good football fan. She knows her stuff. Yeah, right, yeah she does. And uh, she said, Dad, she said, you know, teams have been down to 10 men and have won a game. Yeah, yeah. We got thrashed. You know, it's okay getting beat 1 0, 2 0, whatever. You know, you consolidate, you keep the score down. And unfortunately, um, they just gave, gave in. Liverpool gave in. And that's, yeah. that's not, you know, people talk about the Liverpool way sort of mm -hmm. thing. Well, to me, that wasn't the Liverpool way at all. At, and the defence, uh, you know, where do you start with the defence in Liverpool at the moment? Yeah, yeah. Well, this is it, you see. People have been screaming out football fans to buy defenders. 
when Liverpool finished fourth last season and it was the end of the season, they were actually coming out and saying another four or five world class players they wanted. Mm. World class players. They, they haven't bought a world class player. Not one. No. And the only notable signing, according to some Liverpool fans, is Salah. Yeah. Mo Salah. Now, when he came, you know, people were, were, were delighted, said, oh, yeah, great, you know, great sign. And, but he's not world class. He's a, he's a good player. He's a good player. Mm. But, you know, he's not a world class player. But is that, yeah, he, so. he, he, he might. See, he's a midfield, midfielder. He's, he's, a, he's a winger. But the defence was the priority in my eyes. Oh, yeah. And a keeper. Um, that, yeah, that's, you know, but we, we've had a problem with the keeper for years, you know. But why hasn't it been addressed, in your opinion? <laughs> I think it goes down to the owners. Okay, I personally do. Um, I mean, you, you can't blame Klopp for everything, you know. I mean, once them players get on that pitch, it's out of his hands, really. I know, I know we can change the tactics and that, but you know, you've got to have no, a defence. Yeah, nobody could account for what happened on um, Saturday to, to Liverpool. Mm-hmm. Well, the thing is, as well, which is um, which is prevalent, is that fans on social network quoting Shankly, win, lose, or draw. You um, know, if you if you if you can't support Liverpool when they lose, don't support us when they, whatever it is. You know, don't support us at all. Now, the thing is, Shankly also not one, not many people come out and say this. You know, to answer back, because no matter mm. if anyone criticises Liverpool, Liverpool football fan, if anyone criticises criticises them, uh, this is what they gets thrown in the face, which is I think wrong because mm. they have an opinion, you see, and no one, no one is exempt, shall we say, to a criticism. Now my point is, if someone came out with a Shankly quote. Same uh, same man, same great manager, the father of Liverpool, as I call him. And he said, you build a team from the back. Yep. Liverpool yeah. haven't built the team from the back under this present manager because mm-hmm. he's just neglected it. He thinks, in my opinion, he thinks that he can score more goals than the opposition. And he can't. He, he might do in some games, but he can't in every game score more and there's times when Liverpool will not score. So what are they going to do? And there's times, more times than not, Liverpool will concede. What do you think? Oh, definitely. I mean, if you, if you watched it on Saturday, I mean, they tore us apart down the left and the right wing. Mm. Um, they just, you know, the confidence of Liverpool was just horrendous. But, I mean, I was watching it and, and both wings, I mean, I think every goal came from the wing, didn't it? Down the left-hand yes. side. You know, yeah. So yeah. that's got to be addressed, and uh, I can't remember the name of the player on the right hand side. It's was it Deep Brown? Yeah, he, he was we, awesome. Sorry, he was awesome. Not really a, a big fan of his. To be honest with you, no. I'm talking about Deep Brown of um, Manchester City. Yeah, Deep Brown. <laughs> uh, you got a fantastic team there. And well, I, have, yeah, yeah. What, what have, you're saying there, he was. You know, you, you, um, I'm not a big fan of it, to be honest with you. As I was just saying then, when you mentioned yeah. it... I'd well, the thing is, you see, the thing is, uh, people are saying um, that he ran the show. He ran the show. He, he, he ran everything, uh, uh, all of the play. And unfortunately, we had... There was other... There, there was other, other consequences as well, as some people put over why did he bring on Milner in place of Wijnaldum? Why did he bring off Salah, who was the the best forward going forward? It, so why, is it, yeah, you know, I, so I there's criticism yeah. there that club got. No, I, could, I couldn't understand the Salah and, and the um, that that one because I mean he was working hard down that wing. You seen him? He was he was going past some of them players in the face before they scored that first goal. He was he was the worker. Sorry. You know, now, why did he take him off and why did he bring Milner on? Because he knew he was going to get some stick, Milner, didn't he? Yeah. Well, this is yeah. it, you know. We yeah. just had a message through and we're talking about that, Deep Brown. 
Well, he said, I wouldn't mind him on our side. So that message is wouldn't just... Wouldn't mind every Man City player on our side. <laughs> well, this is it, you see. What I'm going him? to ask you a question before we go over to Terry Mead. Yeah, yeah. And the, my question is, would any of the current Liverpool side, any of the current Liverpool side, if you can cast your mind back to the 2009-2010 team, would any of them get into that team? No. It's, it's strange, no. isn't it? Strange concoction. Uh, I'm thinking of Salah, but... Yeah. What about Mane? OK, I'll put it Not this sure. way. I'll put it this way. Mm. Would you change any of the sensitives for Carragher or Hippie? Well, it, you, no. you've got to ask a qu- you've got to answer yeah. the question because you no. can't let it go like just let it go blank. Would you know? No. Would you uh, change any of the fullbacks for Steve Finnan or Jean Arisa? No, no. I don't think there's any Salah's on the edge, but the rest of them, no. But where would you put Salah? Would you drop Steven Gerrard or Xabi Alonso? Thanks, Frank. Well, I've um, just said, would you well, drop any of them? No, I wouldn't. for Salah. No, you, there you go. No. Would you drop? Uh, would you drop Fernando Torres for Firmino? Oh, it doesn't matter. I'm just thinking it. about that one. <laughs> well, you can't I like, I like him. I like you, you, you like you, Firmino. Yeah. And do, what, what about Torres? Torres scores some fantastic goals at the top of his game and everything else with yeah. Liverpool. But, Unbelievable yeah. player. I'm looking at he the way the game's all changed. Kind, he scores yeah. all kinds of oh, records. Yeah, yeah. He broke yeah. all kinds of records. Firmino will never do that. So, uh, no, I, I disagree with you. But I was, what I was going to say, though, is but Firmino in that team. What you just, you know, that team. Yeah, listen, uh, here's another thing. Uh, someone's just come in again and said, I've just watched the Liverpool v Arsenal game in the Champions League. Not one of the current Liverpool sides would get in that team. Mm-hmm. So there you go. So you're finished now, mate. That's the end of <laughs> I'm that. sacked already. Yeah, you're sacked. You know, <laughs> uh, no, well, obviously, it's your opinion. You, you yeah. prefer Firmino yeah. over Torres. Well, Oh, I can't believe that. But anyway, what we're going to do, we're going over to um, Terry Melia, and Terry Melia is a, a local author, and he's going to be talking about his, his new book, and uh, it's, co- well, it, it's, it, it's called, what does this remind you of? What does this remind you of? Jamie, two weeks in the summer of 76, what does it remind you of? The nice uh, up weather, the ladybirds. Okay, well, I tell you what it reminds me of. It reminds me of a play that was on the telly about their uh, kids going to oh. Wales, wasn't it? Or the lakes or somewhere. No, they went to Wales, didn't they? they yeah. To the zoo. Yeah. Um, they pinched the animals at the end. Yeah, so. Our yeah, day out. Our day out. So that, that particular um, title reminds me of that. And I'm just going to wonder if. It'll be like as I because I I can go back to '76 and it was one of the greatest summers on record, absolutely brilliant. Not a cloud in the sky, just hot every day, and it was absolute. I always remember. I always remember scaffolders working and uh, you were, and they all cut the jeans to the knees, so they, they you know they they had short sort of sort of thing. But absolutely brilliant, brilliant summer. And what we're going to do, because it's hot, it's hot, uh, it's a hot book because it's a hot summer, to be honest. So anyway, is Terry there? Yep, Terry's there. Good evening, Terry. Hello there, very nervous. Oh, don't be nervous. Listen, uh, tell the listeners and everybody else uh, who you are, how local are you? Yeah, yeah. Um, Chilwell. Um, oh, yeah, West the Derby, the Mona. Oh, yeah. It, 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 it comes from the first part. Come on, I'm only joking. Yeah. Come on, Terry. Right, oh, sorry, yeah, I was just thinking about a day out. Willie Russell wrote that, I think. Yeah, you're spot on. You're spot on. Yeah, I really I'll enjoyed that. You. Well, actually, the characters in my novel, they could be uh, those kids in that film mm. um, a couple of years later, during yeah. their sort of later teenage years. Excellent stuff. Excellent, but yeah. did you mind me saying that that it reminds me just the title itself? You know, two yeah. weeks in the summer of seventy six. That it reminds me of that particular well, all day out, shall I say? Yeah. Well, I worked for a long time to try and get 
title that sort of encompassed the whole story. And I think that does it in a bit of a nutshell. You know, two weeks in the summer of 76, mm -hmm. that's exactly where the action happens. It's all within that 14 day period. Yeah. Well, this is it, you see. And it, it's funny because where, where I've got a synopsis and it says, Can I just read this out, please? Of course you can, yeah. Okay, and it says, In his bedroom, Tommy, a working <laughs> class seven year, 17 year old, tries to coax. <laughs> his middle-class girlfriend, Lena, into sex. Now, do you know that this is a, you know, that we're not up to the water sheds yet. I've got to read this out. But that's a, that, that, that's a fine, you know, it, obviously, right there and right then, you've yeah. got, like, working class and you've got the middle class. So yeah. you, we know where we're going, and especially, exactly. like, in the summer and everything else. That's why I yeah. said... This is going yeah. to be a hot, hot uh, novel. So could you tell us a little bit more about it and, you know, where you got the inspiration from, Terry, please? Uh, yeah, well, I think um, all elements of anyone's writing is based on what they know, you know, what they've experienced in their own past. And although the abuse proper, it's the real street names, real locations yeah. based around Liverpool. Um, it is a work of fiction, but it's based on bending the truth of experiences I've had in the past. Good, good, good. I, li I, like the, I like the way you say, like, bending the truth. Can I tell yeah. you something about Plato? Plato, yeah. the great Greek philosopher, and do you know what he said? He gave, a go he gave the gold, you know, the gold, uh, which was the cream of everything. He gave them to kings and philosophers, obviously philosophers. Yeah. He gave the silver to great architects and great engineers and... Even gardeners, you know, great gardeners. And he gave yeah. the bronze, which was the, like, the dregs of society to yeah. historians. <laughs> like we say, we say, yeah. They exaggerate the truth. And he gave um, the, he gave the, 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 the bronze also to writers. And he says, yeah. the writers exaggerate and bend truths. So there you are. Plato mentions yeah. you. <laughs> that's that's is quite heavy. I think it? all the elements um, of writers, that in a way, the sort of maybe unqualified psychologists as well, we're looking at the things that motivate people, uh, the things that bring people together and how they interact with everybody else. Mm. So I think there's an element of a psychologist and maybe sociologist as well within a writer's sort of toolkit. Well, what about uh, your inspiration? Who's inspired you? What kind of writers have inspired you? Oh, I've been... I sort of go through novels in a, one a week, maybe, for the last 30 years. Really? Um, so you use yeah, a novel quite quickly? A novel, very quickly. I've got a huge library. Uh, my yeah. wife always complains every time I move house. So that's <laughs> one of the biggest things in the van. The first that go, the first that go is, the, <laughs> is the box, yeah. <laughs> Same as myself, you know, I have a massive library. <laughs> Mine started off um, back in junior school, primary school even, Christ the King School in Chilwell. Yeah. Uh, reading the C.S. Lewis books, the Narnia series. Oh, brilliant. They really sort of had me gripped. I was, uh, the, the best moments I had was going to the library and finding one that I hadn't read before. Mm. Uh, that was maybe misplaced somewhere in the library. I'd find it in, mm. in the wrong section. Oh, I found one I hadn't read. I'd sort of yeah. run home and read it very quickly. Mm. Since then, it's just, that helped progress to all the major sort of bestsellers. Yeah. Um, I remember reading Sven Hassel, the Brutal Walk stories, yeah. um, when I was in my mid teens. Yeah. Do you know what I used to read? What? Um, Billy Bunter. Yeah. <laughs> I love Billy Bunter in Grey Flowers. Com comics. I just loved yeah. it because I wanted to be there. Maybe it's, I don't know, maybe it was a hidden thing, I don't know, and it came out. <laughs> Of maybe Billy Bunter, I thought it was absolutely yeah. uh, fantastic. Oh yes, oh yeah, oh I say. <laughs> you know, so maybe I wanted to be <laughs> like on a, like one of your characters, a middle class yeah. sort of person instead of uh, you know the usual uh, working class. But anyway, you know. So in modern day literature, yeah. um, who's inspired you? Modern day, um, at the moment, probably John Connolly. Um, the Irish writer, he writes sort of combination of crime and occult novels using the Charlie Parker character. Mm. He was actually in a little bit local last night, actually. He's based in Maine in the States. Yeah. Uh, but last night he was in the Laurel and Hardy Museum. 
Really? Um, in Southport, I think, yeah, giving a, a, a lecture right. on Laurel and Hardy. <laughs> did, you, did you actually go there, no? I didn't, I, I couldn't work wise. Oh. Um, I saw that they had a notification thing on Facebook. You were good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, the, the, well, not so much the literary, but best selling novels these days, like Lee Child, is there uh, Reacher novels, um, anything by Michael Connolly and the Bosch series. Yeah. Well, you know, if you go back to the, um, like the 30s, 20s, and 30s, and, you know, yeah. did you ever read anything uh, by Dennis Wheatley? Because you were That's talking it. about Do you know what? He, I, I'm still. There's elements of that coming out in fiction these days. I can't think of an example offhand, but his sort of astral plane um, voyage is on the astral plane with this yeah. line connecting the sleeping body to his astral spirit mm. that could sort of go anywhere. Mm. They terrified the life out of me with teenage. I spent a lot of sleepless nights. Mm. The devil rides out. Well, funny enough, up you mentioned my window. The, you, funny enough, you mentioned the devil rides out. I still teach English, and uh, that was a novel we did just a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, uh, the devil rides out by Dennis Wheatley. Uh, because in my class, it's, I think you'd be interested in what we've actually had uh, studied. Uh, we've studied all the greats, you know, from the 19th century novelists, you know, from the likes of Mary Shelley, right yeah. up to obviously Dickens and the Brontes and yeah. all these wonderful people, the great poets from uh, the likes of William Blake, Wordsworth, Coleridge. Keats, yeah. obviously, Keats, I love Keats, yeah. Browning, so we've studied those, but when we've come into the uh, the latter part of the 19th century, into the 20th century, we've taken in Thomas Hardy, yeah, there is something uh, yeah. which you may or may not know about Thomas Hardy, which will be right down your street, actually, yeah. and the listeners, do you know yeah. Tessa de Derbervilles, obviously, yeah. you've Ready. read it, yeah. now, what he actually did, he actually fell in love with Tess, his character, he fell in love with the character. So he had to, he, 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 he had to, he, he had to get rid of her. And that's yeah. why, you know, the, she was lying on the, uh, the stone and Stonehenge as the sun was rising, you know, sacrificial through yeah. it. And uh, anyway, she died in the, the novel. Yeah. And as, as though he's exercising or ex well, yeah, it's getting, yeah, that absolutely, from his, from brilliant, himself. absolutely, yeah. because you know oh. she had gone, and he never yeah. wrote wrote another novel after that. Yeah. He just uh, concentrated on poetry. Did you know? I that? never knew that. No, I never knew that. That's, that's very interesting. Did you know what? You just reminded me of something that this is going to sound weird, and I, 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 <laughs> at the expense of sounding weird, one of the characters I had in my novel, if purely fiction, this is no one was based on it purely just out of my head. Um, a, a Welsh young girl, beautiful young lady, Rhonda. Mm. Um, I had, I've come to the end of the novel, the last couple of chapters, I had it all mapped out, bullet points, but right yet, yeah, Rhonda comes in, in the next page, as I'm typing away, I typed, Rhonda walked into Tommy's bedroom, mm. and I, what? I, what? I'm for the life of me, I didn't type it, I didn't mean it to come out, mm. and I couldn't change that, I couldn't actually delete that line from the story, mm. The bits, the action that followed from that came from Rhonda coming into the bedroom, mm. but it spooked me out. It was all the character that yeah. sort of taken over. Mm. I've got a paranormal fella here in the studio. <laughs> and, uh, his name is Jamie Williams, and normally yeah. he, he's, he's on once a month and he talks paranormal. What did you yeah. think about that? What uh, Terry just said? I thought it was dead interesting then, because um, I mean, he mentioned the astral planes as well, yeah. you know, which yeah. you see me eyes would light up then. Yeah. Um, because yeah. I like that kind of stuff, you know, about the, the astral planes and that you're attached to them, and it's supposed to be where Ooh. all the, the information, everything, what happens in the planet now, um, yeah. while we're talking now, that's supposed to be all up there, and we're supposed to be able to dip into it whenever we, we you know, if we can get there. That is. Yeah. I, I, can, I, can I just mention another novel, Exoskeleton? I read this recently. Uh, there's two novels, uh, but the concept is basically um, a CIA torture program. Mm. You sort of get people into this torture program mm. and what they do they torture them to such an extent that their body the soul the spirit comes out of the body um, mm. and he calls it uh, sort of progressing outside he splits his soul from the body mm. anyway sorry <laughs> no, <laughs> I, I, no it's uh, you know again 
it, it, it depends on what genre you like and what you're into. This is science fiction, this. this oh, is science of fiction. course, of, of yeah. course, but I, I, I'm a great avid reader, as you can imagine. Yeah, uh, yeah. But I, unfortunately, I can't read for pleasure. So, and I yeah. ask uh, you know, my people in the class, I say, well, what, what, what do you want to read next? We do poetry, you know, for a couple of weeks, yeah. and then we yeah. go, go back to a novel. And you know what I'm actually reading now? The very first Harry Potter novel. <laughs> so that's, you know, we, we, it's good, the class, because we read yeah. five chapters and yeah. then discuss those five chapters as it goes on. And yeah. we actually, uh, we've done every novel. We even did uh, The Scarlet Pimpernel because in my history class, I, I gave a lecture about the Reign of Terror of 1795. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Robespierre and a fella named Danton, who's a sidekick. Uh, so I did the Reign of Terror, and someone suggested for the English, can we, can we uh, do uh, the Scarlet Pimpernel? I said, yeah, no problem. Mm. So, you know, everything is uh, combined with uh, English and history. Uh, so, Terry, you know, yeah. is, is this your first novel? Is, is it your second novel? or? <laughs> first one I've dabbled for many years mm. um, I did a, a masters in screenwriting going back about 20 years ago yeah. so I was writing short films I had to write a sort of a full screenplay yeah. uh, for that course um, mm. so that was sort of rejigged for the novel yeah. um, which I started writing maybe I don't know, about five years ago dribs and drabs yeah. but sat down and co- for about six months three years ago yeah. Um, and ri- wrote that. that. That is my first novel. I'm working on a sequel to it at the moment. Oh, that's absolutely brilliant, because um, where, where can you get hold of this particular copy? Um, Amazon. Amazon. Amazon.com. It's, yeah, it's available in the Kindle format and yeah. um, the paperback version. That's it's also it's in the Liverpool libraries as well. It's available there. Yeah, yeah. Because, uh, like, um, I, I don't know, it's a Jamie... Did you, do you want to uh, ask a question there? To you? Uh, well, I mean, I mean, obviously, I, I mean, I sent a message over to um, Frank then when he was on writers and poets. And I live in yeah. Heighton and the St John's Estate. And a lot of the roads here are named after poets and writers. You know, there's one called Brown and Close. Um, yeah. So you know, it, it, when you said it before, when Frank was saying it, it obviously pricked my little bit of interest in the Heighton history. But can I ask you a question? You know, when you write this novel or this this book. Yeah. Do you yeah. actually place yourself in in as the character? Do you understand what I, I am, mean? Yeah, I, yeah, I am. Yeah, I, I think. Well, Tommy Dwyer, the main character. Basically, that, that's me. I'm inside that character's head. What, what, what I struggled with was a, a touch of uh, head hopping. Sort of first couple of chapters are based, you know, from Tommy Dwyer's point of view. But I, I was also given insight from another character's point of view, and I had to sort of stop that because reading it coldly a few weeks later, it jarred a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, so it is all from him, Tommy, from my point of view. And and also, you know the characters and the names and that. Do you actually? Yeah. And it's going to sound a bit silly, but do you actually like see characters like that around? Think do you know what he'd make a good, good um, piece in my book? I, I do exactly. Yeah. Well, what I've deliberately done because the novel set nearly for about forty years ago. Um, I've used characters from that past. I've used. I've made a point of not using any from the past ten years. Any character traits mm-hmm. or elements of people that I'm familiar with. Although I haven't said that, I've used people from the family, I've thrown their names on top of characters. You know, oh, jiggle right. them around, like my mother's name was Catherine, but she, the mother's name of Tommy in the novel is Carol. Right. Interesting. That's, I mean, when I was reading, because I was reading the synopsis just then, you see, and that's what I was thinking, because yeah. they're quite good, you know, the, the, the local names, aren't they? These, you know, when you hear the Dwyers, um, yeah. and Lola, you know, things like that. You, they are local names. Do you know why I picked the name Tommy Dwyer? When I was a kid, I was about five, I was hanging around, um, do you know, um, off, off Scotland Road. Yeah, um, Pat Dwyer. There was, there was a Dwyer family there, and we used Pat to say Dwyer. Tommy Dwyer Pat peed Dwyer on the fire, the fire was too hot. Oh, mm. right. <laughs> no, don't don't you listen not. to what I'm saying? <laughs> Sorry. The times I said that. <laughs> Pat Dwyer, because I come from the Scotland Road area myself. Yeah. So El- Elden Grove, it was. Go on. Family I knew. Yeah. Right. Go on. Go on. Okay, uh, Terry, we've come to the end of the uh, of this wonderful interview. 
it's been absolutely <laughs> fascinating about uh, where you got your inspiration and what kind of uh, novels you read anyway and your avid reader and more yeah. importantly yeah. your library your library yeah. which is you know you, you more or less said my library is more important than my wife and kids and no, everything I don't know I don't know about <laughs> that <laughs> Well, anyway, it's, in the next room. <laughs> it's it's been absolutely wonderful. So you didn't feel that like nervous, did you? Actually? Not at all. To be honest, I think you, you just you make me feel really comfortable at the onset. Well, you're um, not the only one who said that. Yeah. So you're in good yeah. company. You're in good company of uh, Billy J. Kramer. Billy J. Kramer <laughs> when he interviewed him, he said yeah. it's the best interview of that. It's you could be just sitting in a lounge, sitting down and just <laughs> chatting away. So. Uh, I thank you for that compliment, sir. I made no, so listen. I've enjoyed it, Frank, and thanks for the, giving me the chance to come on and speak about the book. No, it's it's been wonderful, as I said, simply because, Terry, I love local talent, and, you know, it, it's me. It's me. It, I'm just an ordinary scouser like yourself, and, yeah. you know, we, we, we try to give uh, all our scouts, uh, talented people, some kind of air. And we'll yeah. have you on again, if you don't mind. Oh, yeah, I'd love to, Frank. Okay, really would. So, Jason, I'll uh, put you down and we'll have you on right. and we'll talk about uh, different novels and how your uh, how your particular books getting on through uh, okay. Amazon and everything else, you know, yeah, sales great. and that. Yeah. Um, so uh, you know, we'll we'll be to- we'll be talking lots of uh, words and literature and wonderful novels again, if that's okay with you, Terry. I can talk day and night on that conversation. <laughs> Good. And that's why your family in Scotland loved. <laughs> not, not the boxing family. <laughs> okay. Well, listen, uh, it's been wonderful, as I said, and uh, right. thanks for coming on, and we'll be speaking to you very soon. All right, thanks very much, Frank. Thanks, You're everyone. Welcome. Thanks, Jason. You're Jamie. really welcome. Okay. Bye bye now, Terry. Bye. All right, turn on now. Bye now. So that was uh, Terry Dwyer. He's one of our local uh, talents. And one of these local talents is uh, Terry. And it's absolutely wonderful to think that this lad has written his first novel, by the way. And you can get it on Amazon. You'll be able to pick it up. Uh, or pick it up for Kindle. Because lots of people have Kindles now. And uh, you can get it on Amazon. We love it on our website, uh, where to get it. And what we're going to do now, we're going to go to a song, a wonderful song by the Stones. And you don't say the Rolling Stones, anyway, you just say the Stones. And this one is absolutely brilliant. It's painted black. And take it away, Mick. The best in 60s and 70s music, plus a little bit of history. Tune in to Frank Carlisle every Monday at 8pm here, only on Mersey Radio. The stones and paint it black, absolutely brilliant. I, I, I really, really like that song, you know. It does your feet tapping and everything else. I'm going to read out, because we had Terry Mealier on, and you were talking a little bit about literature, I'm going to read out a poem, Jamie. Right, and I'm going to ask you, you think, wrote this. And I'm going to uh, even ask him over there, you know, that particular producer. Yeah, Okay, I'm going to read this. I'm actually, I'm actually going to read this out. And what it is, it's called Circus Acts. Circus Acts. Is one's life a parallel of Circus Acts? The ringmaster bellowing out one's name. The juggler juggling with one's life. The lion tamer taming emotions of the heart. Tightrope walker balancing one's fate, it seems, while clowns laugh and mock one's hopes and dreams. After the ring's sawdust settles and acts are performed their final acts, what's left only a vacuum of empty space? Into oblivion one's memory fades, meaningful words becoming more obscure. As one ponders what might have been, jaded thoughts already descended, now seems a distance in that vacuum of space and time. All is not lost for fading words and memories, so cruel are the words that need to be healed. 
So cruel are the memories that need to be saved. Determination will see it through. For my unconditional love I have for you. How's that? How's that? What did you think of that? That you didn't know who wrote that, did you? And uh, who did you think of wrote that? I haven't got a clue. I was going to say you, because you surprise me every week. But, you know, getting back to this particular poem, only because Terry was on, um, oh, do you think it was heavy? Do you think it was deep? Do you think it was, uh, you know, what, what kind of poems did you think it was? I, th- I think it's someone who um, thinks, thinks the actual circus is a special place and, you know, is a dying... Dying art now, isn't it? It is a so dying trying art, to, yeah. yeah. So it was life like, like a, a circus, so mm. life is a circus, okay. you know, the likes of the lion tame, it can, can, uh, you know, like taming one's emotions. Mm-hmm. You've got the you've got the uh, the tightrope walker, you know, balancing yeah. one's feet. So you've got all this, even the clowns, you now clowns, there's a new film out called It. And that's oh. about a clown. And we've heard uh, like films, you know, not just uh, not just it, but other films containing uh, clowns. Uh, they don't look at them as like happy-go-lucky people now. They look at them as evil. Uh, and yet, in, in that particular line, it says, doesn't it, the clown mocking ones, like life, dreams, and everything else, hopes and dreams. And, you know, it could be a little bit about it as well. So, you know, all in all, that particular poem... It's very deep. It is deep. It's a deep poem. It's a deep, meaningful poem. And especially when words that was once said in a loving way and memories in a loving way uh, seem to, like, just vanish and fade into the background. That's what the poem's all about. But, you know, the love of one uh, can bring all that memory back and everything else so that's what the uh, the poem's all about I thought it just needed out simply because simply because it's um, uh, you know talking about literature with uh, Terry who wrote his mm. first novel who wrote it Frank? Uh, I did I wrote that mm. I wrote that particular uh, thing anyway uh, getting back now and what have you been up to Jamie? Hey, it was only two weeks ago since it was last year, Frank. So, what's the name? Um, we've been we're sorting out the Halloween night, aren't we? Um, we're, we're, like we're going to have two nights in Mostly Paris to raise funds for the kids. Right. So we're in the process of just getting that all sorted out. Right. Uh, at the end of the month, we're hoping to be going to the Plaza Theatre mm-hmm. over in um, Northwich. I know you won't come with us, will you, Frank? No. no. And um, we've done that before. Yes. Fantastic place. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've we've done that with Searching for Casper. Um, he invited us along, and we had a great night. That's wonderful, that because um, you know you're talking about Halloween, and yeah. lots of people uh, is involved with Halloween. They love Halloween mm-hmm. and for some reason. Obviously, it's uh, it's like ghostly haunting things, isn't it? Because I went to this is in '94. 94, 1994 I went to, I was invited up to Scotland uh, by by a very good friend of mine he just lived outside Glasgow and he came from a very well to do family and his uh, his uncle he was, he was his father's brother um, he owns a castle and he put this Halloween thing on mm-hmm. right and it frightened the hell out of me <laughs> it was incredible it really? it really frightened me. And not only that, but the night itself, the 31st of October, it was lashing down and thunder and lightning. And you should have seen yeah, the way you should have seen the way he did it out. This thing, you know, ghouls and ghosts and uh-huh. howls and oh touching as well. It was it was a, it was it would have been ideal for you, but for someone who's <laughs> a buzz like me, <laughs> frightened me, you know. So, what, what was you thinking? And the castle was haunted, by the way. No, oh, I mean, our group, we, we've always said we'd love to do something like a castle. Mm. And, you know, imagine doing that on Halloween nights and, like you said, the rain, the thunder, the lightning. 
perfect. Not well, for you, but yeah, for us, yeah. Well, this this is what I mean. Other people loved it. Yeah. You know, there was lots of people there. Oh, mostly his family and you know, right. the family friends. Uh, it was wonderful. You know, all of a sudden, he, do you know what he had? Uh, I'll never forget this. You know those long uh, lights that you know hang from you know the, the, on a very long thing coming right down, yeah. and looked like candles as well. And they were going on and off, flicking like on and off. Yeah. And were, it was really frightening. And we went down to the dungeons where the you know the haunting takes place. Proper yeah. haunting, by the way. I'd love to do so that they place. all went, to, and I I went with them because I didn't want to be left on my own <laughs> upstairs. If you know what I mean. Anyway, so you, you've been in a castle, in a haunted castle, in a dungeon, on yeah. Halloween night, but yeah. you won't come with us. Well, this is it. Well, I didn't know what it was going to be like up there, and you know, so I went up and that got frightened to death. So we'll invite you, know. you somewhere, and we won't tell you what we're doing. No, exactly. Well, that, that'll be yeah. it. But it's, yeah. it's just—it was just a wonderful experience, yeah. to be oh. honest. But the rain. Now, don't forget, the rain was out. You know, we never got wet at all. Uh, but the thunder and lightning with these like stained glass windows—that oh, yeah. was, you know, it was flashing. And funny enough, that when the lights were flickering, it wasn't through the tons that it was uh, flickering, by the way, but it was t on a timer, and the lights more or less nearly went out, and a big flash of lightning came and lit up all, you know, the room, this massive yeah. room, this big banqueting uh, room, absolutely Sounds amazing. Like, like a movie scene, doesn't it, that? Yeah, it was. It was. It was. It was, it was incredible, to be honest, Jamie. So, it, it's one of those things that Halloween brings. Um, what do you think? Can I ask you this? Um, what do you think of uh, trick and treat? You know, this Americanization that's already come here because we only used to have duck apple mm. and roasting the chestnuts and everything. Yeah, was it? We did do chestnuts. We didn't? did. Yeah, I mean, they were great. Them days, weren't they? With the apples on a string going across your room and a two pence in them or a five pence in them and things like. To now, I mean, you go into the shops now and the Halloween stuff out there. If we'd about that when we were kids, we'd have been over the moon, but. We have gone so commercialised in it now, like America. It's in, it's, it's, in a way, it's good for the kids, you know. The kids but what about the trick and treat? What? Because there was no trick and treat when uh, we were kids. No, no, no. You know, there was none at all. And trick and treat could be very. It's horrible because I've I've gone past the uh, houses uh, the day after, on the first of November. And what I've seen, windows smashed with eggs, and the yeah. eggs are a terrible, they make a terrible mess, and very hard to get off, yeah. by the way. So, do you think that's good? No, it certainly isn't. Um, sadly, that's just a majority of people. I mean, it's nice when you see the kids coming to your door and they're all dressed up, you know, little ones and that. It's when you get the teenagers, I think that's, and that's no offence to every teenager, but, you know, a minority of them cause you problems like that, and sadly, that's the. The way it is, but um, but as you said, Jamie, about kids, you know, being dressed up, and you see them dressed up, and they brilliant. look lovely, don't yeah, they? Yeah, you know, both little boys and girls, yeah. they look absolutely superb, dressed up as witches and dressed up yeah. as warlocks, and you know, different types, even skeletons, and you've got to go, oh, you're frightened, yeah. there, you know, giving them the sweets yeah. or whatever. Yeah, but you whack them when you say that, or you. No. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I love Halloween, you know, it's, yeah. it's, um, it's a great time. Um, usually we're on a, a ghost hunt somewhere, so I really enjoy it. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, the, I think it was last year and the year before, I missed out on the kids banging on the door. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, because we're out and about, and I say to my lads, if they come, there's a big bag of sweets here. Did anybody come when I was out? No. But we've had the sweets. Mm. And that's what I like. They've got their phones on, they're on the Game Boys now, aren't they? So they... So they took the bag in the other room because they weren't answering the door and had the sweets mm. between them. Well, this and is last it. year it was you, you and the others who nicked the sweets when we were on the yeah. Halloween night yeah. on the radio. Yeah. Well, this is yeah. it. <laughs> Thanks very much. Yeah. But you know, don't you think that uh, the way it is now, as you mentioned about commercialism, mm. uh, because people, even even these shops that you can buy, not buy but hire costumes for every occasion. 
uh, they have these it's wonderful s- things. Sadly, it's becoming more competitive. Who's got the better, yeah. you know, outfits mm-hmm. and things like that? And that's the sad part about it. But yeah. you know, not taking it away from the nights. I mean, no. it's fantastic when you see the kids dressed up, whether they've got their own little face paints on or not. The effort's been there, and you know, it's more for the kids now, and that's what it's important is. Well, w- w- you know, when's it the transition? If you can uh, explain, I hope you can. Uh, when's it the traditional uh, Halloween start? What was it all about? I don't mean give me a date or yeah. anything. You know what? What is the tradition of Halloween? That's all I mean. I think it's the nights. It's, it's, it's supposed to be the night of the, the, the dead come back alive again, and that's what it is. You know, don't ask when they go. Thirty first of March, thirty first of um, October. It's time to go out and that. But it, it, you know, it, it's it's a night where the, the dead's supposed to come back. Is it supposed? To, yeah, it, it, but is it supposed to be? Like long lost uh, relatives or something, and that can talk to you. Or, uh, no, I think well, it's just the dead come back to visit yeah. to because the, it's all know. Saints' Day, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that's what I, you know, that, what I've been brought up to believe is yeah. it's the night of the dead. Mm. So why, if the do you think someone has capitalised, so to yeah. and manipulated the situation and said we'll make this in two? Of course, of because course. one of the greatest films was Halloween, Halloween. Yeah. one of the greatest films ever made that because that yeah. was frightening but who made that frightening it wasn't the fellow with the the mask, the mask on it it was uh, the wonderful actor who do you think I don't mean you know who played uh, Michael Myers who, who was the star that's, no I'll tell you who it was, was, she, was she in Halloween? I, I'll tell you who it was it was Donald Pleasance yeah. Yeah. So you know, you for com- completely, completely forgot, forgot about, about him, that man, yeah. and he made that film. His voice, his everything, his actions, his body language, everything. It's all right, you know. Jamie Lee Curtis screaming. That's mm-hmm. you know that that's immaterial. But it's the acting, the professionalism of that particular yeah. man, yeah. and his he's evil. You know, come yeah. on, he's evil. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely mm. brilliant. You know, so he made that particular film, and he was followed then uh, Carpenter, wasn't he? You know, his films yeah. were, and Deborah Hill, who was the producer. So anything produced and written by or mm. whatever, he did the music and he directed it, Carpenter, but he also uh, did the music and everything else. I never knew that part. Yeah, and produced it along yeah. with Deborah Hill. So. I'm a film buff, you see. I can tell. <laughs> and I, I, I love uh, I love films. I love clever yeah. films. I don't so, watch many horror films myself, though, because yeah. because I do paranormal. I find them to be a bit over the top, you know, to what we do. Well, I'm going to tell you a film to watch, and it's a cle- do you like clever films? Yeah. And um, this particular film is called The Atonement. It's a very very clever film, The Atonement. It's a new one out now. And I actually watched it and I said, that's a very, very good film. I like clever films. I've written that down to watch. Well, Jane, you know Jane Basnett in our group? Yeah, yeah, she yeah. went to watch It the other night. Oh, with, yeah. Uh, with well, what did she think? She said it was fantastic. Right. So I'm itching to see that one now. That's Well, watch it. It's abs- and, and Maria, if you're over there in Florida... We know that you're listening Maybe, in, yeah. and uh, I want you to watch it as well and send a message to either myself or Jamie about uh, Atonement, The Atonement, not Atonement, because there is a film made a few years ago called Atonement, but this is called The Atonement. But it's absolutely wonderful because Mark Kinnish, he's on his holidays, but he's in um, Windsor Cornwall. You can't say Hurricane Alley, can you? You know, the likes of Florida and Hurricane Irma, which is horrendous for the people of uh, America, and our hearts go out and having thoughts and yeah. everything else to them, because no matter what, these particular hurricanes, there's always certain deaths, and we can't be having that. And w- what's the anniversary today, any idea? 9-11. 9-11, absolutely yeah. horrendous. Um it's it's one of those things that, unfortunately, and I mean this, unfortunately, uh, 
has destabilized the all of the world as it is today oh, yeah. and that's that's what's going on because just before I came to the studio getting picked up and things I was watching uh, the news and I was watching uh, these poor people coming from Mania going into Bangladesh and some of the horrendous stories because they were Muslim uh, houses being burnt and it, it was absolutely shocking and you know, I'm talking about old people uh, you know talking and they were just saying one particular lady she wasn't old but uh, her husband had been burnt alive along with her sons and daughters raped and you, uh, you know so this is what you have and, and it was all true in my opinion 9-11 and uh, the consequences of 9-11 for the 2003 Iraqi invasion yeah. which destabilised the whole of the Middle East and that just spread globally now because don't forget there was terrorist acts there's been terrorist acts in Australia as well, Bali of all places, mm -hmm. terrorist attacks there, besides as you know Europe so it's just it's just absolutely horrendous I mean, it's just absolutely horrendous. What what's sad though is it's not shocking anymore. It's it's become a, a you know a daily thing. I don't mean shocking in a, in a, um, a disrespectful way. It's just it's become now a daily thing. If you understand what I mean, there, Frank. Um, I, it, the world at the moment is just horrendous. Yeah. It's just yeah. a you know you every day there's there's something sad happening. You know. Um, I mean, what happened to them people and that woman to see? You just can't comprehend it, can you? No you one can comprehend, comprehend everything. That. But you know, there's a saying, you know, you don't know how lucky you are or anything like that. You know, if you've got a problem, for example, um, and people say, oh, well, look, you know, you've only got to see what's happening in uh, Iraq or Syria or anything like that. It's a different kind of problem you have. And I don't like mm -hmm. that saying, you don't know how lucky you are. Uh, the only thing I say is about taking things for granted. Taking things for granted. We do take things for granted. And that's, mm. the, you know, but people have problems. And when people have problems, it's a different kind of problem. But other, unfortunately, uh, other things that, that have happened throughout the world, that doesn't get rid of your problem. No. And even when people say, well, you, you know, you don't know how lucky you are, or it puts things in perspective. It doesn't because you've still you've still got that problem to oh, deal yeah. with. No matter you know if people think it's trivial compared to like getting bombed and everything else, you have still got that problem and you mm. have to deal with that problem. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you think I'm right or well, do you yeah, think no, I'm wrong? No, one hundred percent. Well, well, the thing is, okay, well. That was uh, wonderful talking about Halloween oh, yeah. and problems and Maria over there. And we, I've just seen a film, yeah. what you've just shown me, uh, yeah, of, the, uh, of that, what she yeah. sent us through, didn't she, the yeah, video? Yeah, um, Maurice Briggs, she sent to me um, a video of what it was like over there, you know, yeah. from, from their perspective. And it, it, it was weird because, you know, you, you know, when you know someone who's over there and they're right in the middle of it, mm. or, you know, yeah. close yeah. to it, it does worry you a bit, you know, because there's no way out for them. They've just got to, no. you know, ride it. Yeah. And that's what they've been doing. And to get to, you know, to get a message to say, we're okay, yeah. that's, you know, that's an important one. It's it's just horrible. I just want to say anyway, um, I've got to thank Jamie for coming in at the very last minute, very short notice, because uh, the guest that we were having tonight, Andy Gamble from Searching, he just got back from Germany because it's a tribute act to the Searchers and they're the best band, in my opinion. They're the very best band, uh, tribute band, that is. Mm. And they're absolutely wonderful. Andy is a super, super person. And he was going to bring along Jamie Summer. He's a singer, you know, in his own right. Yeah. He's not part of uh, Searching, the band. So... And he was supposed to come along. We were supposed to be talking music and everything else and what's coming on at the Epstein Theatre, which I will talk about a little bit later on.
But unfortunately, his wife was taken ill, and his wife, he just got back from Germany, and the next he found her that she was in a hospital. You know, he just comes home and, Dad, you know, listen, Andy, you know, uh, Joanne's in yeah. hospital. So listen, I just hope that uh, nothing is that serious, and she'll be well again, and we will be having Andy on, and Jamie, uh, because he was bringing him here. Uh, so we will be having them on in the very, very near future because we want to talk about the show that's coming on, the Epstein, in October. So just listen out for that. Anyway, what we're going to do, we're going to go to half time. And this is um, <laughs> these particular songs is in, aimed at being a pun or a couple of puns, uh, to be honest. Uh, you know, for the hurricanes uh, that's happening over there in America, it's something in the air by Tons of Clap Newman. There's something in the air. Absolutely brilliant. That brings great memories back for me. And uh, Good Vibration by the Beach Boys. I'm picking up Good Vibe. So that that's on. So these two songs. And we'll be back with uh, my other special guest, which is Michael Carter. And he. Is all the way over there in Belfast, and he's a big, big Liverpool supporter. And what Michael will be talking about is football. Okay, so we'll be back later on with Michael Carter and uh, Jamie staying here with me, and uh, we'll be talking lots more. And then after um, the wonderful Michael Carter, we have the beautiful Joe Whitaker. Who'll be t- giving us more about uh, Hurricane Amy, 9 11, Donald Trump, and everything else that's going on in America? Okay. And funny enough, she has a boat hole, Joe, in Barbados, so she'll be telling us a little bit about that because that's being hit uh, very badly, anyway. So, uh, back to right now and something in the air and good vibrations. So, we'll take it away. Tons of clap. The best in 60s and 70s music, plus a little bit of history. Tune into Frank Carlisle every Monday at 8 pm here only on Mersey Radio. Wasn't that absolutely fantastic? Something in the air and good vibe. I'm picking up. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. The Beach Boys and Something in the Air by Tons of Clap Newman. So it just shows you, doesn't it? You know the way things have gone especially over there in America, you know, with these horrendous hurricanes. Yeah. And, you know, <coughs> when you see pictures of the eye of the storm, and yet, the eye of the storm, if you're directly underneath it, everything is calm. Well, it was weird, I mean, I don't know whether you watched, um, I mean, I watched CNN all day yesterday, you know, with it on, and to actually see what was happening, and it was great because they had like um, a fella explaining the storm to you, yeah. and um, the fellas were hanging on. I don't know how you've seen; they were hanging on and trying to do the inter- you know, the, the presenta- yeah. presentation thing. Yeah. And um, you know, he was saying it's all right. In about five minutes' time, it'll kill calm. And five minutes later, it's, it's you know, yeah. and how does he know? Well, obviously, he's an expert. Yeah. Yeah. And he said, but in an hour and a half, that's going to come back the other way. Yeah. Um, because of the way the, the, the hurricane is. Yeah. Can I get my head round that? Yeah. How it turns, you know, and comes the other way? Well, you, you look at the uh, the weather extremes or the extremities of the weather, you know, you have cyclones, tornadoes, mm. you have these eddies, uh, everything, tsunamis, yeah. everything is going on, even volcanoes, earthquakes, you name it, everything's happening. Because what's forgetting now is the earthquake that happens in and cause lots of deaths. In Mexico, yeah, Mexico, yeah. It's just, it's just become a mad. Do you think people say that? Um, I, I'm talking about people who believe in, you know, certain things that they say. They're saying friends of the, is it friends of the earth or somebody? They're saying that the earth is actually angry at what's happening uh, to it, to Thank the earth sure, itself. Yeah. You know. With all this bombing and everything else, it's well, shaking the foundations. Look what happened in North Korea, that the, you know, the nuclear yeah. test, six point yeah. whatever it was. Yeah. You know, Where to what, what's, stopping that, what's stopping yeah. saying that part of it? Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's strange, isn't it, the mm-hmm. way uh, some things happen? It's not only that. You've heard of David Dyke, 
Mm. Right? Yeah. Now, David Dyke gives lectures to packed houses all up and down, all over the world. Uh-huh. And he actually predicted uh, these hurricanes, tsunamis, everything he predicted, every, everything that's, you know, coming in, he's predicted. Uh, and I'm it? talking about uh-huh. years ago when he's predicted them. So, what, what explanations? That? Well, and even yeah. the polar ice caps melting, by the way. You know, you shouldn't yeah. forget that. Uh, is it global warming? Is it, I just don't know. I can't understand what global warming is, to be honest. No, I don't. I mean, I, I mean, I think man is part of what the problem is. Um, I, I really do. I think all these experiments we're doing and, you know, the, the, the explosions... See, the, well, it, what you're talking about, their experiments, there's experiments that we're unaware so of no, anyway. No. Yeah. Even now, what's going on now... Uh, I seen a science fiction film once, and it was about controlling the weather. Yeah. Now I wonder if that could be happening because the, I know it's a conspiracy theory, but people think that. I I, I look at it this way. I had a great astronomer on um, oh, last year. Was it last year or this year? I don't know when I was. I think it was last year, and Gerard Giller's name was. Now, what has happened? I said to him, I said, isn't it wonderful and unimaginable to think that we sent a space probe out 10 years ago and to land on a little piece of rock, you know, a comet? Mm-hmm. Uh, he said, yeah. I said, I, I can't, but I, I just can't get over it that it's gone 10 million miles. Well, that was in the planning for 30 years before mm-hmm. they sent it off. In the planning for 30 years. Right. But it, make, it makes you think, doesn't it, Frank, if they can do that and send something that far on away... On a little rock. What can they do here on this planet? Exactly. You what know, we don't know anything about. Exactly. It's You've got Area 51. Well, yeah, you know, this Area 51 is, uh, is absolutely amazing because yeah. what's there... What do they see? What's being seen? Why yeah. can't they get in there? He, 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 there's a fella named Bob Lazar, and Bob Lazar has been discredited because he said when he first went to an interview on the telly, mm. he said, I'm going to be discredited. And this is before he gave the interview. This is before in he you? said, I've been threatened and everything else with my life if we give this interview, but they can't kill me now because I've already said it. There's a... There's a letter with me lawyer. He said, but I'll be discredited for everything. So, does that explain everything about no. Bob Lazar and Larry of 51 and what he's actually said? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, they're going to try and discredit you anyway, aren't they, no matter who it is. Um, I mean, we all laughed. I mean, everyone laughed at David Icke. Yeah. And I don't know whether you've ever watched any of his lectures on, you know, on YouTube. I've, and Yeah, they have. I've seen it's a couple Very of interesting. Them. Of you know, his theories is. are very interesting. I mean, people think he's mad. Listen to him. Yeah, exactly. Because once, you, once, you, see, anyone can discredit anybody. Of course, you can. And you, yeah. I'm not saying that you, you know, you're, you're brandished as a, 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 you know, a madman, and then the stigma mm. sticks. No, it's just that these people who want to, who want to discredit. They've got the means to discredit anybody, mm. even if you're just uh, out on a night out with people and you don't like it. You, you take, I'm talking about ordinary people here, and you just see someone who you don't like, and if you don't like that particular person, you could say something to another well, person. Do you know him? Mm. He or do you know her? She, yeah. and they'll say, albeit that they don't know them, and they don't know them either. You know, but you want to give them a bad name. You've that's stigmatized correct. them, yeah. and that's that's the end. And it's it's just awful yeah. the way things, the way things go. But anyway, Jamie, uh, what we're doing? We're going over to uh, Michael Carter all the way over there, and in, in uh, Windsor, Belfast. It must be Windsor over there. If it's not, I wonder why. Anyway, uh, are you there, Michael? Good evening. Yeah, mate. Good evening. Yeah, mate. The sun's cracking the flags today, Frank. I, I believe so. You know, but the sunny Belfast, you see. Yeah. How's Ruben? No, he's sitting there right next to me now. Is he sitting oh, there right next yeah. to you? Do you know what? I was talking to Michael one day, and he's got this dog, 
right? And he said, I said, where's your dog? He said, oh, it's in, in front of the fire in its basket. He said, and do you know what it's done? I said, no. He said, it pulls its blanket over itself. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. You know, this is... This is, this is Ruben, you know. Anyway, but we have a laugh about Ruben and everything else. So, so listen, Michael, uh, you're a big, big Liverpool fan. Yep. So, what, what what happened? Can you give us your idea about what happens on Saturday and that heavy defeat? It was a disaster, wasn't it? The alarm bells were there, uh, ringing Wofford, wasn't it? We well, let the three okay, goals in. you know that. Yeah, you know people same have same mistakes said, every season. Yeah, well, th- th- this is the alarm bells we're ringing, and lots of people were saying, uh, "Why haven't we sorted the defence out?" These are the Liverpool supporters. Why haven't we sorted the defence out? Because what we need, we're prioritising again midfield. Uh, why haven't we sorted the defence out? So, what do you think uh, is needed in the Liverpool side now? They need the defenders, don't they? Really, they need to, well. They need to go out Christmas and buy defenders. If they don't, forget about the Champions League next season. Forget about it. The the crying out the crying out for two centre backs and a, a goalkeeper because the, the two goalkeepers we got. I said this on the last time I was on the show, Frank. Yeah. They're, they're not. They don't fill me with confidence. Okay. The two keepers, to be honest, and the centre backs don't fill me, especially Clavan and Matip. They got caught out big time uh, Saturday, so. But what about it's the youngsters? Do you think? Well, what about the youngsters on the the boat left and the right? Uh, do you think that they're ready, especially Alexander Arnold? Do you think that they're ready for this level? You know, the next level up. Are they ready for that? No, because I'd, I'd like us to have two, a right back and a left back who come in. St- who are world class who just straight in you know and just go straight into the team and then gradually bring them in in the League Cup games and the yeah. FA Cup mm. games you know work them in gradually yeah, because two lads into a, against a side like City yeah. it's not going to build the confidence boost the confidence any good is it no Obviously, it's not uh, don't get me wrong they've played well but uh, yeah. it's, it's not good at the moment well it wasn't good at, it wasn't good uh, Saturday anyway it wasn't good viewing no no, and um, lots of these, Liverpool, lots of Liverpool supporters were, you know, very very disappointed uh, the way they, the way it went because they went one nil down Liverpool. They went one nil down. And but you're getting fans. You're getting fans, Frank, who were saying, "Oh, the the red card changed it. We were losing one nil then." Yeah, yeah. So that did. As far as I'm concerned, that didn't change it for me. It was just a total collapse. Yeah. You just give up, absolutely give up, yeah. and that, that to me is unacceptable. And then when you criticise that on Facebook, and you're getting called fickle, or you weren't saying that when we won, we, to be honest, yeah, Arsenal had the chances to score, but they didn't put the ball in that. They'd done it the season before at the Emirates. Yeah, they come. We were four one up, and they come back to four three. They could have either drew the game or won the game yeah. last season. But someone pointed out as well, Michael, when uh, Liverpool played. Crystal Palace at Anfield I think it was the first home game yeah, they were lucky uh, to win that if Ben Teke would have put that away it would have been you know, when it was nil-nil it would have been an entirely different game he had missed it and, an, an absolute sitter didn't he so what's your take on sacking, that and that sacking that they bought today that, that's a total disgrace that. you can't you can't judge a manager on four games no. yeah. you know what I mean that, that's a total disgrace that. that's yeah. just football gone mad but going back to Liverpool we have good games and then everyone because we have these like we played we beat Arsenal 4-0 everyone thinking ah oh, we're back that's it it's all sort we come against City and they just showed us all our weaknesses in one game like they scored two goals two goals got disallowed and they scored two goals identical ones that got disallowed yeah did you notice that yeah yeah and huh? that to me is unacceptable it's just totally unacceptable well, well, I know well, you're going to well, lose games but what about the sending off? Uh, do you agree with the sending off? Or I'd say it was a bit harsh, to be honest. With you. Okay. you know, if, if the keepers, if the keepers coming out the box, and he he wants to head the ball, he, the players they got every right to, to go for the ball. You know what I mean? Every right to go for the ball. He's unlucky to catch him. Could I just... And there was an incident in the Newcastle game. 
with exactly the same thing, yeah. and they only got a yellow card. So it it depends on what referee you get. To be honest with you, but it, it, is it the referee off. or is it the rules? This is it's very it, it's very hard to say. Uh, well, rules are for one and rules are for others. If the yeah. or, or the referee, you know, you, you, people can blame the referee. Uh, it, unfortunately. The referee has been getting the blame for Liverpool's heavy defeat. He was absolutely trashed. No, no chance, no chance. We were one nil. We were one nil down already, going going into that title. So you can't blame the referee. They're, they're just looking for ex- like you got people turning around saying you never shook claim Klopp's hand. I'm not interested in that. All I'm interested in is the results at the end of the day. Five nil, five nil thrashing. That's the, f- the heaviest defeat against City for the 70 years, 70, 80 years. 80 years, it was the heaviest defeat. He- 80. You know, and, you know, you, you've got to think, Mike, that um, the likes of Liverpool, that this team, they're an enigma, they're an, an, an enigmatic uh, team, and people all over the world, you know, watch them and support them, everything else. And yet... Uh, I always remember going back to the Paisley days, and Paisley yeah. was criticised. Bob Paisley was actually criticised. No one said anything because people had a people had this passion, enthusiasm, and everything else for Liverpool Football Club. Uh, yeah. And if Paisley can get criticised, even even Shankly was criticised because. Yeah. Supporters were saying he's keeping hold of the uh, the players that you know are too old now. The likes of Saint John and everybody else, if you can remember. Uh, I don't yeah. know, you won't remember, but you know you, you must have read about it. And Shankly yeah. was criticised. Kenny Dalglish was criticised. Even Joe Fagan. Joe Fagan uh, was criticised during uh, his treble year because they got beat once and they went, yeah. what's Joe doing? You know, yeah. But there was no comebacks. Rafa Benitez, uh, Julia, they were all criticised. Yet these particular managers won everything for Liverpool football. And I've, well, I've, I've criticised. I've, you've got to criticise managers. If you don't, they're not perfect. You've got to criticise managers. Well, here's my point, Mike. Here's my point. Uh, you know, if anyone criticises uh, the Liverpool manager Jurgen Klopp, what what what's the response? Uh, you know, by other. You no, know, you're getting called. Uh, you're getting called plastic. You're getting called fickle. You you're getting told to support another team. It's like if you criticise the owners, and you know, you know my views on the owners. Yeah. I I I I just don't think they're totally right for the club. They're just there for the money. They're. The, it's just profit before glory, in my eyes, with the owners. They don't show any ambition. And they got the fans turn around and say, what's the net spend got to do with it? Well, the net spend's got a lot to do with it because it's shown how much we're spending in the summer. And £40 million for the Champions League side. I'm sorry, but that's totally unacceptable when you've got Bournemouth, the West Broms, who are spending more than us and they're not in the Champions League. And, that, and they think that's OK, £40 million net spend. No, I'm sorry. It's it's not good enough, and Klopp's got to become under criticism criticism as well, because why is he chase one player during the summer? Why chase one player? There must be loads of players out there, central defenders out there who we can buy. Why chase one? Well, do you think that uh, he's never had the resources really, you know, to buy other players? Because what's being said, even after the the end of last season. Everybody thought that um, the Liverpool manager would uh, would address the defence, ex- and he said that they needed at the least the four play. Michael, can I finish, yeah. please? That they needed at least four players for the following season, and what they're saying now is that they've only bought one one decent player, and that's Mo Salah. But he's not a defender; he's an actual uh, forward. Yeah. Uh, no, it's. I was excited at the end of last season because I know because you had the Champions League, and I thought the owners have got to put their hands in the pocket. Well, you, spend the money. But people were told Liverpool supporters were told that they had a two hundred million pounds war chest, not treasure chest, but war chest. So that yeah. that means that they were going to buy these players. I don't know how many for two hundred million. 
so that they can consolidate the team, could consolidate that particular four place and do a big assault on the league and also the Champions League besides the domestic cups, but it didn't materialise. No, well, it's the same story again. It's, that's why I don't read the Echo. Like I, I, I can only read the Echo online, and I, I, I don't even bother reading the Echo online. Even when I go home to visit, I don't even bother reading it because it's to me. I find the Echo is just a PR stunt for the FSG. It's like they're, they're coming out with the stories now. The Echo saying we're going back in for Van Dyke January. Yeah, I'm not believing any of that unless he's holding a shirt up at Anfield and he's shaking Klopp's hand. Don't believe any of it. Yeah. It's just this is just to appease the fans. This is just to get them all. Oh, oh, we could get them, and then saying sorry, he didn't want to come, or we could we couldn't pay the money. No. We've got the money there. Liverpool have got the money. They, they've got the two years TV money, the sponsorship money, the merchandise money, the the stand, the main stand is paid for itself for yeah. through the corporate. There's not many like the cheapest ticket in there for the. The middle section with the red, um, you know, the middle section above mm. the first level, that's three thousand pounds for the cheapest season ticket. I know that because my brother applied for the for uh, beginning of the season. Yeah. Um, that's three thousand. It goes up to six. So we, you look how many people are in that section there, and how much money that's generating. And then they got the corporate, the boxes, mm. and and they generate millions upon mm. millions. And we're not spending in the transfer. No, we're not spending it and. You're getting these fans going, oh, this is not the Liverpool way. I said, well, what do you mean, not the Liverpool way? I said, if you go back to the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, even the 90s, we were spending big money on players. Yeah. At the time when we were winning league titles in the, the 60s, 70s, 80s, we were spending big, big money. At well, the you've time. only got to go, you, you, you know, you just mentioned the 90s. I'll uh, reaffirm when you come into the, uh, you know, the millennium. What you'd also got, remember when uh, Liverpool paid out, it was an astronomical fee then for yeah. Fernando Torres. So they did spend big money. They've always spent big money. But yeah. you think it's a, it's a new philosophy with, um, with the likes of Klopp because what they've said about uh, Jürgen Klopp, that he can make great players out of nothing, you know, from ordinary players into great players. Well, but someone oh, came oh. out and said... Well, he, ne- he hasn't made the defence, and he's been yeah. this is his third year. So why hasn't he made the defence any better? Well, this just sums up sums us up where we are at the moment. When you look at the uh, Manchester City subs coming on, and you go, oh, "God, I wish they were on our bench," and then you've got like of Milner coming on to try and show up. Yeah. That's where we are at the moment, yeah. and people are, are excited. That's our vice. That's where we are at the moment when you've got the likes of Milner. Coming on. Well, the likes of, uh, you know, I was talking to a, a, a supporter of a red, a red supporter, and he turned around and said, uh, to be honest, to have the likes of Milner coming on, uh, he's a free. And, uh, you know, That's he so came as a free. He didn't pay any millions for him. He came as a free. And you'll have the likes of Matip, who's a centre half, and he's yeah. a free. And what he turned around and said, he said, you don't win anything with uh, freeze. Well, I'll ask a question to you now, Frank. Right? How oh. the, the top sides in that Premiership, right? Chelsea's, Man United, City, Arsenal, Tottenham. How many in their squad have got players on freeze? None. Transfers? None. 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 That's it. So that answers the question, doesn't it? Well, the thing I, is, uh, that w- well, the same person asked me that. Yeah, funny enough, he said, how many of the top teams have uh, got frees? How many of the top teams just go out and pay eight million for a, you know, a defender that they, that they badly need? <laughs> uh, yeah. what, what, who else goes after uh, relegated club players? Yeah, for he the first time, Liverpool. sorry, Frank, for the first time in years, and I mean years. Like I've always looked. For, I remember when I was a kid, and we, I remember we, we were buying like say Peter Beardsley, you know, and John Barnes. I remember that season, the '88 side. And, yeah, yeah. and then you're looking at them, and I said, I can't wait for the season to start. And look at them players we're buying: John Barnes, the, yeah. John Aldridge, uh, Peter Beardsley. Yeah. You know, fantastic players. Yeah. And they were Name fantastic Sunez. players. Don't forget. Yeah. But I, I'm talking about when I was a school kid, and yeah. I, I, I used to go to the matches when I was. Uh, 15, 16 
Yeah. And it used to it used to queue up for hours before, and then now nowadays, like our team and our squad now, I'm looking. I'm, I'm not even looking forward to the season to start because I know what's going to come. I know what's going to come. Like I was, I was disappointed. In Watford away, we, we we let three goals in. Um, we played with Crystal Palace. We just about won that. And then we we play Arsenal, and then we we won four nil. I wasn't I wasn't doing cartwheels down the street because I know I knew that this was what happened. Saturday was gonna come. Mm. It was gonna come, and it did. Yeah. And you, you got players go. You got but you got people turning around to you saying, "Oh come on, it's only one game in. We've only lost one. Ge- we've only lost one game. Yeah. It's the first game we've lost all season." Yeah. And I'm going, "Yeah, but can't you look at the bigger picture?" Why we lost it? Why we and how we lost it? Look at the bigger picture. Yeah, the thing is as well. Uh, I remember someone putting up and said it was it was the first goal we conceded or something like that. It was, uh, and I, I said, what game? I forget what game it was. And I think they just also they were blinded by the the uh, the Arsenal game. Absolutely blinded. You know, they, they they thought, wow, you know, we're going to take off with the Rockets. It's the first uh, goal we conceded in everything else. I forget what game it was. Um, people talking to me, and yeah. you know, they, they, they forgot all about the Watford game. Watford. I know. Was I was in... Watford's are no Barcelona or Real no, Madrid no. or Chelsea or Man United or Man City or any of them. It's Watford. Well, look at the Hoffenheim games. Yeah. I think they scored three goal passes. Didn't they? Fair, yeah. One in the. Uh, their home leg and their two yeah. goals yeah. but we still went through they still managed to score three goal passes mm. and they were sloppy sloppy goals they got like Jamie Carrick at the beginning of the season after the Watford game turned around and said what, what have they been doing all summer yeah. what have they been doing you've got Klopp coming out with saying Clavin's 100% better than last season what, what's all that about yeah. 100% better than last season yeah and, and uh, he, 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 Marino he, was it? Uh, Marino couldn't back. even get in the side last year, and he, he's the he's the left back. Where, where's yeah. Robinson? Where's he? What's happened to him? Is he injured? Thing is, uh, he, he might be saving players for the Champions League because that's what I was going to ask you now. What do you think of uh, Michael? Do you, do you fancy staying on till ten o'clock? I'll tell you for why. Um, we can't get hold of Joe. Joe's. Got, it, got through to us and said, I can't connect because of the stormy weather. Don't forget, she's in uh, Hollywood. Yeah, that's She's fair, in yeah. California. So, unfortunately, you know, people who have tuned in to listen to uh, Joe, yeah. uh, no we're just going to talk uh, to Michael Carter and football. Would you like to say a, a word, Jamie? It's Jamie Williams, who was Hi, also Jamie. a Liverpool su- supporter. Hi, Michael. Nice to see you again. Nice, um, nice it's, dead, it's dead interesting what you were saying about the Liverpool team there. And we have had these problems for a long time. Um, do you think Klopp went up to uh, the, the owners and turned around and said, there's a list of players I want? And they turned around and said, no. Too much, too much. He's, you know, like that. I know it sounds a bit, you know... Uh, List, you well, know. look at look at the. Don't get me wrong, don't get me wrong about Robinson. Right, I hope he turns out to be a good player. You know, I really do. Uh, I like. I hope he really does. He's a young lad, but we need up and running players in positions, key positions now, who are ready to go into that side. Um, and look how quick it took to buy Robinson from Hull. Didn't mm-hmm. take long at all. No. That was an eight million pound player. Now look how long it took to get Salah when it went over the thirty million. The haggling, yeah. and I can't see FSG in a million years paying seventy, eighty million for a player. I'm sorry, but if they were going to do that, why isn't Kaita at the team now? Why didn't they just pay the money, go here's the and money, and come in now instead of? Oh, you can come next season. We'll have you for forty-eight million or what? I don't know how the how the deal went, but to me, that was just to appease the fans. That's a very uh, interesting point when you mentioned. Uh, um, again, I was. If you could imagine being Kaita's man, uh, uh, agent, right? And I'm going to ask both you and Jamie this. Uh, you know this particular preliminary uh, contract that's supposed to have been signed, you know, and he has yeah. a medical. Mm. I just believe the medical, because why do you have a medical when you're not actually going to play that season? Yeah. 
Do you well, understand? Mm-hmm. So I dismiss I that. I think that's a load of nonsense. Well, here's, here's what, here's what well can I finish and this, Mike, please? Because it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important well, then, question, sorry. which I, I think. Anyway, so suppose Liverpool don't qualify for the that's Champions League. Do you think Keita will, you know, sign the, the, you know, sign the preliminary one? And don't forget that it's only a preliminary one. Yeah. Barcelona have already offered seventy-five million pound for them. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. think about it. What do you think will happen if Liverpool don't qualify for the Champions League? Well, me personally, I don't think he'll come to us. It depends if he's. If there's a clause, like these players have clauses now. That's um, what I'm talking Emery, about. Agents. Yeah, yeah. Do you Emery think the agent wants a clause in his? Do you think uh, the agents has come in and said, "Well, okay, he'll sign for Liverpool, but," and that's that's where the clause mm-hmm. is. If Liverpool fails to qualify for Europe, uh, he won't come here. Okay. Yeah. So, um, come on. Do you want to say I something, I, Jamie? I just think, sorry, um, sorry, Michael. I just think if that if that's the case, we don't get Giorgio. It's goodbye. You yeah. know, he's going to go to Barcelona. And can you blame him? No. Well, this is it. You see, uh, because players of the caliber of this Kaita, and you know, they just want to be on the big stage. And that big stage, yes, the Champions League. If if Leipzig were not in the Champions, well, okay. Uh, Michael said, uh, "Why didn't he just pay the money? Because he'd be here now." So, what about uh, well, like Gilchrist uh, has just uh, uh, messaged here. He says, "Into this discussion about the mess that is LFC's uh, debacle." So now that's a Gilchrist, and a Gilchrist is a, is a he's a, a good Liverpool fan, a great Liverpool fan. And obviously he's disappointed. And I'll just say this, this interesting discussion about the mess that is LFC's debacle. So, again, you're having Liverpool fans who are worried, they're absolutely worried about what could happen this season and about what could happen, you know, with the likes of Keita. But you could end up losing Coutinho as well. Well, this is it. You this is up it. losing Keita yeah. and Coutinho. Yeah. And Emery can. I think Coutinho has gone anyway. I think he'll go with Chris um, personally, uh, Michael. I don't um, think it's a. Uh, uh, I wouldn't put it past FSG to sell him in January. To be honest with you, well, I wouldn't put it past them. Yeah, well, look at the money. What they're asking for him? Yeah. Well, uh, Ed Gilchrist. Uh, uh-huh. Ed Gilchrist has just said. Has just said. Um, Hang on, he said it's not it's not debacle. Well, you know, I think people. Are there. He said it's defence. It's the defence. So, Ed, uh, Michael, uh, I'm sorry, but we have to go over to uh, Hollywood, wonderful right. Hollywood, and Joe uh, Whitaker, and she's going to tell us all about uh, the show. Michael, it's been absolutely wonderful. It really has, and. Thank you very much. Anyway, no, it's been great, and you know, for Ed Gilchrist to come in and say an interesting discussion, and Andy Gamble, he said, are absolutely brilliant. Uh, it's just been great, and you know, it, it, it has, and you put a, put a, put your case over very well, and brilliant. I think some Liverpool supporters who'd be listening in will go, "Wow, I agree with that." Like a Gilchrist and Andy Gamble, and Andy Gamble's a Liverpool supporter as well. So, once again, Michael, thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much, boys. I'll see you soon. Okay. See you soon. Thank Ta-ra. you, Michael. Bye bye. And Ed Gilchrist, before you go, said, Nice to hear you, Michael. <laughs> All right, Ed. <laughs> okay, mate. See you All later. Right, thank you. See you later. Ta-ra, boys. Bye. Ta-ra. So, what we're going to do, we're going to go right over. No, we're not. Uh, we were going right over to Joe Whitaker, and it's it's interesting, isn't it? You know, the, we, uh, finally, you know, we've got old of uh, Joe. No, we haven't because um, he's. He, I always keep getting them fingers up at me. It's the weather, isn't it? Yeah, I'm glad it's not the middle finger that's coming up. You know, <laughs> to be honest, but oh, two fingers. It's just the one. It's the index finger. Give me one minute, you know. So. 
What did you think of Michael's uh, synopsis there, or assessment yeah. of synopsis? It's nice to have someone like him who, who you know sees the bigger picture. Yep. Okay. Uh, this is absolutely wonderful. We've got Joe on the line. Hello, Joe. I hope so. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Oh, wonderful. Because we thought that we were going to lose you, you know, because of these storms. So what? What? What's happening there in California? I suppose you've missed it. Now, we, we tend to get quite a swell in the ocean. The advisory yeah. is don't yeah. go into the ocean. These, the rip currents are, are, are worse and yeah. the sea's higher. Yeah. It's a lot more dangerous. You know, you get a knock-on effect, but nothing as drastic as um, they've been getting in the Caribbean and yeah. onto Florida. It's been yeah. quite a... It was quite nice to see the storm go settle down to a tropical one. Um, yeah. I mean, the devastation... I mean, us as Californians, you know, we live every day with the risk of an earthquake. Yep. And nothing is dramatic, as dramatic as a hurricane. Absolutely. We're, we're, we're so lucky here. We, we have, we, we get tropical storms, that's about it. Well, you, you have many, um, you have many uh, typhoons, don't, not typhoons, what are they? Uh, I forget what you call them. But in the Midwest, what are, what do they call those uh, cyclones? Cy- cyclones, tornadoes, tornadoes. You have many of them, and only in America in the Midwest, and they're very, yes. they're very, uh, you know, sinister to say the least. Absolutely. I mean, I was watching some of my dear friends in uh, Florida who were able to still go online. Isn't technology great? Yes. But- yeah. We're watching, and you know, thankfully, all, they're in new buildings, new apartment buildings, and you know, they've got you know, hurricane windows in place. You know, the regulations are that you know, you can't build anything unless you, you, you're planning for such, such uh, natural disasters. Yeah. But saying that, you've got to look at the small islands out there, yeah. you, know, you know, in the shanty little towns, you know, yeah. little prefabs, yeah. But I tell you what's sad though, uh, Joe, I remember uh, Hurricane Katrina going back to 2003 and the unfortunate, or 2004, and the unfortunate thing is that they've just been left, that was under George Bush administration by the way, it's George W, and when, when that hit New Orleans, you know, the poorer part of uh, that particular New Orleans has just been left. Nothing really is there uh, being done. And I, I think that the likes of this particular thing, that's if Florida also uh, Texas, uh, something will be done uh, in those areas because they're more affluent, aren't they, than, you know, down the poor uh, district of uh, uh, um, New I Orleans. Say, I have to say you would hope so. Yeah. Um, for some people who are, are able to afford insurance, which is very expensive um, to cover some, some, some such disasters, yeah. so not not a lot of people can actually afford the insurance to cover themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Get, you know, a lot of people homeless. They've got no homes to go to. They've got they've lost everything. Yes, yeah. And you know, you'll get the small islands. Will get a lot of help. You know, you know all these little Caribbean islands. You tend yep. to get a lot, yep. lot more support. Yep. But you'll find these parts of America, like you say, going back to Katrina, they're just forgotten about. Yeah, there's, there's no fallout. Yep. You know, you get a bottle of water and a pack of the crackers and somewhere to put your head a couple of nights. Yep. But after that, you know, these places that are offering free accommodation right now will close down. Yep. What you got? You've got you've got hope. Your friends, your family have survived it and are able to to help out. If you're on your own, well, the thing is, got? it's like uh, this particular country. Uh, no matter, we have a, a, a thing. The government has a thing called overseas aid, and when something happens, people say, "Well, why can't we put our own country first? Because America themselves, they have overseas aid. And they, no matter where where it happens in the world, whether it's an earthquake, a tsunami, or you know, hurricane or whatever, they're the first there, along with the British. Well, the, the Americans are there, you know, with all this aids and everything else yeah. and helping. So 
why haven't they held their own? And, and this is, you know, the likes of uh, after the Hurricane Katrina. Why haven't they held their own? And do do Americans think like this? Absolutely. And um, you know, you've only got to go, go to these 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 places where they haven't recovered from the last hurricane, and 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 it is they're not helping. You know, these, these little bits of you know, we'll, we'll fund what, fund what, fund building my new house. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> accommodation so me and my children can, you know, have somewhere to sleep. Yeah. No, you 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 relying on handouts and that's the system. You know, it's hard. Where whatever reason you have to claim unemployment, you know, you lose your job, you lose your heart, I don't know. There's, there's no system in place that's set up to really, really enforce helping these individuals who have just the whole lives just get swept away, and it's sad. Well, people sad. would say about you know you mentioned uh, the terminology there of system. Now the thing is not in place, and it's same here. You know, there's not lots of things not in place because we have food banks where it's being reported that nurses who are actually working have to go to the food bank. So there's, there's things like that. Not only that, but people would say. That America's system, uh, what's well and truly in place, and especially under this fella, uh, Mr. Trump, Donald Trump, President Trump, is uh, the capitalist system. It is very much so, and you're very right to say that. And the only reason we brought him in because of the frustrations of, you know, m- most of Americans not getting an, every, anything done. It's the same thing we did when we let Tony Blair into government. You know, we need to change the system. Yeah. How are you going to change the system? You've got Trump stepping off a, a helicopter at the White House with his wife, with a two, you know, a three three hundred thousand dollar purse attached to a to a to a to her hand. They have no touch with reality. No. They don't know what it's like for the average people to to survive such disasters. You know, you've got an island that's ninety percent being washed away. What do these people do? Where do they go? Yeah. Who helps them? Nobody. Yeah. You know, you go to lie. The British have sent out over 500 support people to these isolated islands. And that's great. I mean, without that, what would they do? Nothing. Exactly. Exactly. But it's, it's see, once, it's only what you said, and you were spot on just before, when you said um, about after Katrina, you know, the, the people got their heads down. And once every, once the AIDS workers and everything left that particular area, they were left on their own. So they had to fend for themselves. And it's the same as in, uh, you know, th- these uh, Caribbean islands now. Once, once the British leave, once the Americans leave, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? They're on their own. And I forget where, I think one of the lads might just help me out, Uh, and even you. Uh, Remember a particular place in the Caribbean, I saw it was an earthquake, and it's at the air, it's at this, it was just rubble. And that was a few years ago. Can you you remember now? Yeah, I remember, absolutely. And, uh, you know, that that place is devastated, and that hasn't even been built up. No, no. And it's, it's sad because these Caribbean, these small islands that they, that their trade is nearly 100%, you know, holiday trade, you know. Yeah. People coming on vacation, and that's what, like, how they survive. And I don't know. Haiti. It was Haiti. Haiti. Uh, Michael Carter's just said it's Haiti that was hit. Remember it? And yeah. it, it was absolutely horrendous, you know, to think that it was just devastation, just devastation. And people, people, you know, were wondering about it. They, they were like uh, zombies, uh, excuse the uh, the language there, but they were like zombies walking around. They had nothing, absolutely nothing, and no one's done anything for them. No, no, I, absolutely. These you're seeing these people, you know, they can't find their moms. They can't find their you know, people walk. It's just the same. It's just barbaric that there's nothing in place yeah. yet yeah. in modern society that can 
okay, it's going to happen. That's what you, you you take. You live in a tropical environment. You get yes. hurricanes, you get earthquakes. Yes. I'm on the Santa, Santa Tana. I mm. could get an earthquake right now. Now, yes. um, I hope I survive. Yeah. If I don't, who's going to come and bail me out, you yeah. know? Yeah, yeah. And it is a shame because you, you mentioned uh, uh, Mrs. Trump, and the first time that she went to Texas, uh, Houston, it was absolutely saturated. It was it was terrible, and you see her walking across a lawn to the helicopter in a pair of high heels, which is absolutely and then she was just there simply because it, it was a photographic. Um, Opportunity for her, you know, the first lady, and there she is, and all the uh, all the uh, bling, shall we say? But I think she made more of a fool of herself than uh, a president's wife, you know, first lady of the United States. I don't know. I think <laughs> what can you blame it on? Why are these hurricanes? It's, it's a category five storm that thankfully went down to a two, yeah. but. The weather, the climate system, I don't know. <laughs> well, it's, yeah. a, it's a crazy time in, 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 in the uh, planet Earth at the moment. Yeah, you know, it you, is. It is. Uh, all the flooding in India, yeah. you know, what, what, it's all uh, global warming at yeah. its finest. <laughs> well, as, you know, you, you mentioned about... Um, these monsoons in the likes of Bangladesh and around the the the, the, uh, the India uh, Peninsula there, but you've also got the mi- minors and the minors are crossing over. They're being hounded out by Buddhists, uh, and they're crossing over into Bangladesh, one of the most poorest of countries in the entire world, and they so they're suffering as well from these uh, horrendous floods of monsoons and. It's the the world's just gone crazy, unfortunately, Joe. And Joe, we've only got one minute left, and I'm I'm awfully sorry. And Joe, I'm absolutely delighted that you're okay, albeit that you know you're in uh, in California, but uh, and you wasn't in your uh, bolt hole there in Barbados. But I'm absolutely delighted that you're okay. I'm absolutely delighted that uh, your phones are uh, not, you, we got hold of you. Not only that. We all love you dearly. <laughs> and uh, we'll see you next week. We'd love to. I want to do a few good movies out there. Our good old Judy Dench is uh, playing a great role. Let's talk about that next week. Yeah, great. Now do that, Joe. We'll do that. We'll talk about Dame Judy. What a wonderful British actress. Oh, I love her. I love her. I'd, <laughs> I'd marry her and I'd marry you as well right away. <laughs> you know, I'd be a bigamist. We have to be a Mormon. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you later, Joe. Bye now. Pleasure. Peace and love. Well, that was a wonderful Joe Whitaker, our world world correspondent. And all I've got to say is thank you, Michael Carter, uh, for uh, joining us. Terry Melia, uh, the wonderful local author, he joined us. And, of course, Jamie Williams, who came down at very short notice. Next week, we'll have Paul Capper. Paul... <laughs> Laura Gilchrist and of course Egg Gilchrist on the show next week and uh, we're our very very special guests uh, one Derek Shelmerdine who'll be talking about Steve Marriott and the small faces and everything else no we won't Hendrix. Ed, Hendrix we're talking about Jimi Hendrix he's already spoken about Steve Marriott I'm awfully sorry so I think Capital will be absolutely delighted with that because uh, Hendrix and his guitar. So all it says from me and Jason, without Jason, there wouldn't be a show from me. Frank Carlisle, from Mersey Radio, God's willing, see you all next week. Thank you for listening in and bye-bye. Bye.